Well, good evening, gentlemen. I'm very sorry not to be with you in person. I have been looking forward to this conference since the time that I received the invitation, and I'm so very sorry that circumstances prevent us from being together. But I'm thankful that uh, you are able to watch these videos, and I pray that God would bless you in the time that you have together, and that the words would be a blessing to you. Right, almost from the time that I received the invitation, there has been one passage of scripture that has been on my mind, and that is the passage to which we're going to be turning for these four sessions, namely 2 Corinthians 12, verses 1 to 10, Paul's vision and his thorn. I want to begin with the reading of that passage. In fact, we're going to start the reading at verse 30 of 2 Corinthians 11, and I'll read through to verse 10 of chapter 12. I will pray briefly and then reread the verses we're going to be thinking about this evening, verses 2 to 4, and then launch into the first message. Well, let's hear the word of God. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, reading from verse 30, and I'm using the English Standard Version. If I must boast, I will boast of the things that show my weakness. The God and Father of the Lord Jesus, he who is blessed forever, knows that I am not lying. At Damascus, the governor under King Aretas was guarding the city of Damascus in order to seize me. But I was let down in a basket through a window in the wall and escaped his hands. I must go on boasting. Though there is nothing to be gained by it, I will go on to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man was caught up into paradise. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And he heard things that cannot be told, which man may not utter. On behalf of this man I will boast, but on my own behalf I will not boast except of my weaknesses. Though if I should wish to boast, I would not be a fool, for I would be speaking the truth, but I refrain from it, so that no one may think more of me than he sees in me or hears from me. So to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. And we give thanks to God for his words. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the privilege of coming together to your word. We thank you for the ministry of the Spirit in giving this word to us in the first place. And we pray for his ministry as we grapple with it this evening and over these four sessions. Lord, speak to us, we pray, and grant that our meditation upon these verses would be a great blessing to us. We thank you for this time of conference and 
thank you that though speaker and hearer are not able to be together in the same room, we are nevertheless through this technology able to share this time together. May it please you, Lord, to be with us and indeed through the whole of our time together. Lord, help us as we listen. Help me as I speak and grant, Lord, that it would be truly to our spiritual prophet. We ask all for Jesus' sake and for his glory. Amen. Well, for this first session, we are going to be looking at verses 2 to 4. So let me read these verses again, and then we'll launch into the first message. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man was caught up into paradise. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And he heard things that cannot be told, which man may not utter. And though Paul is speaking here in the third person, it is evident from the passage as a whole that he is speaking about himself. His letter is to the believers in Corinth. And according to Acts 18, verse 11, Paul stayed a year and six months in Corinth, teaching the word of God among them. Next to Ephesus, it was his longest ministry. What is more, since leaving them, he had written letters to them, he had made visits to them, and yet not once in all that time, in all that ministry to them, had he said anything about this experience of being caught up to heaven. Paul is breaking a 14-year silence. Perhaps this is the first time that he has mentioned this to anyone at all. Certainly, it is news to the Corinthians. So why, after so long, does he break the silence? What induces him to speak now about this remarkable experience and then go on from that to speak about the thorn in the flesh to which the experience gave rise? Well, the simple answer is this. Paul felt pushed into this. The background is familiar to you, I'm sure. There were certain men claiming to be apostles who had gained an influence in the Corinthian congregation. And Paul's great concern in this letter, what we know as Second Corinthians, is to counteract that influence, for it was a bad influence. These men were false apostles who were preaching a different Jesus from the Jesus whom Paul had preached. They were in grave danger of being led astray. And that is what led to these disclosures. But for the presence and the activity and the influence of these false apostles, Paul would have been silent about this experience. That would indeed have been his preference. But because of what they are doing and the influence that they are having, Paul feels compelled to break the silence and to tell the Corinthians about what had happened to him 14 years before. Now we'll come to closer quarters with these false apostles in another session. For now, I want you simply to see what this section of the letter is. One more example of God's overruling of false teachers and their activities for good. 
It's a fascinating subject in itself. False teaching is an evil. It is something that does incalculable harm. But the sovereign Lord who permits it has overruled it again and again for good. I think, for example, of the greater understanding of the truth to which false teaching has led. Here's William Cunningham in his historical theology. It holds almost universally in the history of the church that until a doctrine has been fully discussed in a controversial way by men of talent and teaching taking opposite sides, men's opinions regarding it are generally obscure and indefinite and their language vague and confused, if not contradictory. Controversy, in other words, has forced believers to think, to examine the scriptures with greater care, to formulate its teaching with greater precision. And the result has been a greater understanding of God's word than there was before, and a literature embodying that understanding that has proved beneficial for generations following. But let's go further back to the days of the apostles. And in the days of the apostles, we have something much more basic. The activities of false teachers being overruled to the writing of Scripture. And it is remarkable, isn't it, just how much of the New Testament was written in response to the activities of false teachers. And you could quote as well as I can the various books of the New Testament that illustrate that. Galatians, Colossians, the letters to Timothy and to Titus, 1 John, 2 Peter, Jude, all to one degree or another, forged in the fires of controversy arising from false teaching. The Lord gives his enemies a voice and then he overrules their errors for the production of New Testament scripture. Well, here in 2 Corinthians, we have another example of that, and especially in the final four chapters. Were it not for the activities of these false apostles, these four chapters would not have been written. And though that doesn't make the activity of these men any the less evil, how thankful we are for the Lord's overruling. For all of these chapters have brought blessing to the people of God over the past 2,000 years. Each has its distinct contribution to make to the completeness of New Testament revelation. And I venture to say that no part of them than the part that is before us in these four sessions. 2 Corinthians 12, verses 1 to 10, Paul's vision and his thorn. Well, in the next session, we will look at Paul's thorn in the flesh. For this first session, the remarkable experience that necessitated it. So what can we say about it? Well, I have five things to say about it. And the first is this. It was an experience of being in heaven. Verses 2 and 3. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man was caught up into paradise. And again, as we noted earlier on, though Paul modestly uses the third person here, he is speaking about himself. That's apparent from the passage as a whole. Paul is relating here his own experience. So what kind of experience was it? 
It was an experience of being in heaven. And we start with this word in verse 3, the word paradise. This man was caught up into paradise. It's a word that takes us back to the cross of Calvary and to Jesus' promise to the dying thief. Today he will be with me in paradise. It was a reference to heaven, to heaven now. It's used also in Revelation 2 of the future heaven, the final heaven, of which the present heaven is a foretaste. To him who overcomes, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. So Paul has got up to paradise, to heaven, to what he calls in verse 2, the third heaven. Why does he call it the third heaven? Well, one suggestion is that Paul is reflecting here a threefold understanding of the heavens. The first heaven, the sky above us. The second, outer space with the moon and the sun and the stars. And the third heaven, the dwelling place of God. That's one view. And then there is Calvin's. Calvin's takes the language symbolically. The number three, he said, is made use of by way of eminence to denote that which is highest and most complete. We sometimes say of something that it's the nearest thing to heaven. Well, Paul has gone beyond that. He has been to heaven itself, which marks him out, of course, as a singularly privileged man. Everyone else, the sight, the sound, the experience of being in heaven, that lies beyond death. We ourselves are not going to be caught up to this third heaven, to paradise until we breathe our last. Paul had the privilege of visiting heaven in advance. He was there before his death. Perhaps the closest parallel is that of the Lord Jesus in his transfiguration. When our Lord was transfigured, the dividing line between heaven and earth was to all intents and purposes removed. But it came to an end and he went on with his ministry. And so with the Apostle Paul, he is given a taste of heaven, but it comes to an end. And then he goes on with his ministry. So it was an experience of being in heaven. Secondly, it was an experience that had for him an element of mystery. Paul had had many years to ponder this experience. And I am sure that during the 14 years since it happened, he had thought about it over and over again. And certainly he knew where he had been. He had been in heaven but there was an element of mystery to it for him. Let's listen again to his language, verses 2 and 3. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man was caught up into paradise. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. There was an element of mystery in it for Paul. Had he been caught up to heaven bodily, as Enoch had been, as Elijah had been, as the Lord had been at the time of his ascension, or was it just his spirit or soul that had entered paradise, as would happen later when he died. 
Paul doesn't know. He knows what took place. He was caught up to heaven. But how it happened, whether in the body or out of the body, that for Paul was a mystery. It could have been either. Both were a possibility. The only one who knew was God himself. Now there's something very interesting about Paul's words here, and that is the implicit testimony that he bears to the capacities of the human spirit in separation from the earthly body. Let's suppose, for the sake of argument, what Paul would be very happy to admit, and that was that it was an out-of-the-body experience, that it was merely his soul or spirit that entered paradise. That might very well have been the case. Paul was not unconscious. He was not without the power to think, to see, to hear, to understand. He speaks in verse 4 about hearing things. And in verse 7, he speaks about the surpassing greatness of the revelations. Apparently, the separation of the spirit from the earthly body is no hindrance to the reception of these revelations. I think of the souls in heaven at this very moment, awaiting the resurrection of the body on the last day. They are separated from their earthly bodies. And yet in some way or other, that lack is being made up to them. Theirs is evidently no diminished, shrunken, inert, unconscious existence. On the contrary, one could argue from what Paul tells us here that their capacities have been enlarged. Paul heard things that could not be told. Unspeakable words. What the NIV translates as inexpressible things. The communion of saints. The communion of the Lord and his people evidently being carried on at a level far above what we understand and experience here on earth. So there's the second thing. This experience of being in heaven was an experience that had for Paul an element of mystery. Was it in the body, out of the body? He cannot tell. Thirdly, it was an experience which for us is shrouded in mystery. Shrouded in mystery. Take, for example, what was a puzzle to the Apostle Paul? Was this experience in the body or out of the body? He doesn't know, and nor do we. After 2,000 years of reflection, we are no nearer a definitive answer to that than the apostle was himself. And then there's the experience itself. Back to verse 4. And he heard things that cannot be told which man may not utter. Or as the NIV puts it, he heard inexpressible things, things that man is not permitted to to tell. When the Apostle Paul was in heaven, he heard things. He received, verse 7, surpassingly great revelations. And we naturally wonder what they were. What were those things that Paul heard? And the answer is, we don't know. For one thing, to use the NIV's translation, they were inexpressible things, unspeakable things, things that he could not 
communicate. Imagine you were to fall heir to a magnificent mansion. When I visited the province a couple of years ago, Ted and Lorna Donnelly took my wife and I to Mount Stewart. Well, imagine you fell heir to Mount Stewart with its rich history, with its magnificent grounds, with all those remarkable features externally and internally. Here's the question. How would you adequately describe it in advance to a three-year-old? Your three-year-old child or your three-year-old grandchild? It would be very difficult, impossible to do it adequately. And so with heaven. It is so beyond our experience, so above our ability to understand that had Paul tried to communicate what he had heard and seen. He couldn't have done it. Think of that story of the Dutch ambassador who told the king of Siam on one occasion that back in his country, back in Holland at a certain time of the year, the water became so hard that you could walk on it. And the king of Siam, who had no experience of ice, responded by saying, I have often suspected you of falsehood, but now I know that you lie. Inexpressible things, things that we have got no experience of, that we cannot comprehend, that cannot be told. But that wasn't the only reason why Paul was silent which man may not utter, which man is not permitted to tell. In other words, even if he could have conveyed what was communicated to him, what he heard there, he would still have been bound to silence. What he was told in these moments in heaven was a secret. They were for his ears and his ears only. Things that man may not utter, inexpressible things that man is not permitted to tell. So there's our third point. If for Paul there was an element of mystery in this experience, for us the whole experience is shrouded in mystery. We know that he was in heaven, but that's the sum of it. And we think to ourselves, how frustrating, how disappointing. Wouldn't we love to know? Why do we not know? What can we fall back on? We fall back on the wisdom of God. Had we needed to know more than we do, more than the Bible tells us, then the Bible would have been a bigger book. Or we would all be having experiences like Paul. God in his perfect wisdom has given us enough. And what is more, that enough is not barely enough. It's not the equivalent of a meagre allowance, one that allows only for what we might call a subsistence spirituality. In his disclosures of the glory that is to come, our Lord, as befits his character, has given generously. There may not be much in terms of amount, word count, we don't have pages and pages and pages about the heaven that is to come. But by the blessing of God, what we do have is so enriching, so comforting, so stirring, so alluring, so joy-giving, so peace-giving. Brothers, let our understanding grasp more and more 
of what has been revealed. Let the information that God has given to us of heaven now and the glory that is to come be subject to our meditation day after day, and there is no measuring the blessing that will be ours. Yes, we would love to know more. We would love to know what was poured into the apostles' ears, but we have enough. And by the blessing of God, we prove that in our own personal experiences. Let's take a fourth point. We're thinking about this experience of being in heaven. And the fourth thing that we can say about it is, it is this. It is an experience from which the whole church has benefited. Indeed, it's not so much, it's not too much to say that it is an experience from which the whole world has benefited. And I want to start with a question that this whole business raises. Paul, his lips are sealed. Calvin asks, someone will reply that what Paul heard was needless and useless. For what purpose did it serve to hear what was to be buried in perpetual silence? In other words, there doesn't seem to be much point to it. He gets these surpassingly great revelations and they're inexpressible. He can't communicate them. And even if he were to try, he's forbidden. There doesn't seem to be any purpose. Well, Calvin answers his own question, and we'll touch on that in a moment or two. But before we do that, there's a principle of God's dealings with his people that illumines this whole subject. And it is this. God always has the future in mind in the things that he ordains for his people. Their future growth, their future usefulness, their future comfort, their future safety. The work that he has for them to do, the lives that he has for them to touch, the circumstances that will give rise to his glory, the likeness to Jesus that they will gain open theism with its denial of God's knowledge of the future and over against that the teaching of the Bible that's the polar opposite is the truth. God has our futures planned and it's always working towards what is ahead and he's doing so right from the beginning. Our parents, our upbringing, our education, our church experience, the circumstances that surround our conversion, and all of these things, God has our futures in mind. The experiences that shape us, the bright experiences, the dark experiences, the very sins that he permits, always, 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 God has the future in mind. It's among the opening notes of this second letter to the Corinthians. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. He's thinking ahead. He has our future in mind, the ministry that this will allow us to have to our afflicted brothers and sisters as he comforts us so that we can in turn comfort them. Or a little later in that same opening chapter, we felt that we had received the sentence of death. 
But that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. Again, God is thinking ahead, as it were. He has the future in mind, teaching Paul and his associates to rely more fully upon himself. God always has our futures in mind in the things that he ordains for us. Well, taking that principle, it, let's apply it to this experience of heaven. What is ahead for the Apostle Paul? Fourteen years before the writing of Second Corinthians, it's reckoned that Paul was in Tarsus or perhaps in Antioch assisting Barnabas. What was ahead for him? Well, one thing was extraordinary suffering. Enough, says Calvin, to break a thousand hearts. And what a list we're given of those sufferings in this very section of his letter, reading from the end of verse 23. He speaks about being often near death. Five times I received at the hands of the Jews the forty lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea on frequent journeys. In danger from rivers. Danger from robbers. Danger from my own people. Danger from Gentiles. Danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers. In toil and hardship, through many a sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. And apart from other things, there is the daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches. Who is weak and I am not weak? Who is made to fall and I am not indignant? ahead of him. Extraordinary suffering. Ahead of him too, equally extraordinary service. His amazing career as an apostle of Jesus Christ. All these missionary journeys. All these churches that he's enabled to plant. And above all, these 13 letters from his pen that have come to us in the pages of the New Testament scriptures. And then with all of this ahead of him, these extraordinary sufferings and this extraordinary service, he has this extraordinary experience caught up to the third heaven, hearing these inexpressible things, receiving these surpassingly great revelations. What does God have in mind in ordaining this experience for the Apostle Paul? What he always has in mind? Paul's future. All that he has for Paul to face. All that he has for Paul to do. The sufferings that Paul is going to endure the service that Paul is going to render. In a word, this is preparation. And if we were able to trace it all out in detail, I am sure that you would see that this experience gave its hue, a particular tint to the whole of Paul's after life. It's there in his perseverance. It's there in his courage. It's there in his faith and in his hope. It's there in what he says about Christ and his gospel and about salvation and about the glory that is to come. And that's why we can speak about a church-wide, even a worldwide benefits 
flowing from this experience of heaven, private as it was for the apostle, mysterious as it is for us, locked away in his heart as it remained. It helped to make Paul the blessing that he was to his own generation and to every generation since. And it is along the very same lines that we are to think about the experiences that the Lord grants to us. And especially, I'm thinking here of the bright side of Christian experience. During the weeks and months of lockdown, we went through as a congregation the life of Joseph. And you know that one of the principal lessons of the Joseph story is how God uses dark experiences to prepare his people for the things that he has for them to do. And you are very familiar with that in your own experience as gospel ministers. Comes out in your preaching again, again, and again. So too in your counsel. The purposes of God and the difficult things that he has brought you through. God, your future in mind, enhancing your usefulness through the dark experiences. But it's not just to the dark side of Christian experience, this Christian experience that this matter applies. It applies to the bright side as well. That's where we are with the Apostle Paul. And we've been there ourselves, haven't we? I dare say that none of you to whom I am speaking have ever been caught up to paradise, to the third heaven. But you are not a stranger to the bright side of Christian experience. Those occasions in public worship, when either as a preacher or as a hearer, the Lord has drawn particularly near. Those experiences in his house and the gatherings of his people that are never to be forgotten. Precious times of prayer. Conferences that are forever memorable for some message. God had specially for you the joy of seeing him work in the lives of beloved family members and the lives of people in your congregation. Experience of peace when to judge by outward circumstances you ought to have been in turmoil. The bright side. And it's left its mark, hasn't it? It has helped to make you the preacher, the pastor that you are. Some of these experiences so private that you've never disclosed them to anyone. Others, well, perhaps you have spoken of them. And from them all, God's people have been blessed for it's these things that have given you courage and they've strengthened your faith and they've comforted your heart and they've deepened your experimental knowledge of God and they have made you wiser than you were before and Christ more precious than ever. They've helped to make you all the more able to commend the gospel to others bright side of the Christian experience. We're not strangers to it. And God in ordaining that our future, not just as believers but as gospel ministers in mind that we might be the better able to minister to others, to serve Christ, to advance his kingdom. Fifthly and lastly, an experience that will one day be ours. 
in the first chapter of his letter to the Philippians, Paul writes about what death was for him. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And then he tells us why. For it is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. That is one conviction, unquestionably shaped by the experience through which he had passed. He had been there. For a few hours, we don't know how long, he had known what it was to be in the presence of of the Saviour. Little wonder that he could have this strong conviction that to die was gain, that to be with Christ was better by far. And eventually the time came. What 14 years before this was just the briefest of experiences has now extended for 2,000 years. Paul in paradise. And who can tell what Paul has seen and heard in the course of these 2,000 years? Well, one day, if the Lord does not return in our lifetime, we will join him there. It's our hope in the face of death. It is gain for believers to die. And for the very same reason, it is to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. We don't know what it was like for the Apostle Paul to be there 14 years before the writing of this letter. We don't know what it's like for him to be there now. But one day, by God's grace, we shall know I wonder to how many of you the name of Bishop Charles McElvain is familiar. One of his books was published a number of years back by the Banner of Truth. He was a college student along with Charles Hodge. They were great friends and whilst Charles Hodge went into the Presbyterian ministry, Charles McElvain became a minister and bishop of the American Episcopal Church. A delightful biography, if you ever have a chance to obtain a copy of it by William Carus. And at one point he's writing to a daughter on this very subject of death and his hopes, very beautiful. He writes to his daughter, I'm well aware that my health is in a critical state and that in a moment I may pass away. But I trust I shall be found in Christ Jesus whenever the call comes. It seems so like going home to go to the presence of Jesus and the assembly of his departed ones. I feel a sense of lively pleasure often in thinking of it, just as one does in prospect of a delightful journey to some beloved place. Death, I do not realize, seems abolished. I overlook it. It seems like a stream to be crossed down in a valley of the road. But I look so much at the hills of blessedness beyond that it scarcely comes in sight. Just one of these things that underscores in red ink the blessedness of being a believer. What is in store for us? This experience of heaven, brief for the apostle, here and now, since then, has experienced for almost 2,000 years, one day, our experience, when for us too, to die is gain, for us a departure to be with Christ, which is far better. 
Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the experience of heaven that you gave to the Apostle Paul. And we thank you for the way in which that coloured all that he said and did, his whole after experience as an apostle and servant of Jesus Christ. And how, though we perhaps can only vaguely realise it, we are the beneficiaries as we read his writings, as we study his life. Lord, thank you that you always have the future in mind and the things that you ordain for us, whether they be dark or bright. And we thank you that we are no strangers to the bright side of Christian experience, though we wish we knew more of it than we do. Lord, draw near to us, we pray. Give to us precious seasons of communion with yourself that we in turn may be the better able to commend Christ to others and to comfort others with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted of you. We thank you that though heaven is a strange place to us now, it won't be always so. Thank you for the anticipation, the sure hope that is ours in Christ. And we pray, Lord, that as life goes on, our longing for the presence of Jesus would deepen. We especially pray that he would come soon and that everything would be brought to its consummation, to his eternal glory and to our eternal blessing. Hear us, we pray, for his name's sake. Amen. Thank you, brothers.